he does want to destroy us on every hand. And often we've been taught that he's not serious. Often we've been taught that it's no great big deal. But it is a big deal. Because of the fact you were manifest to destroy the works of the devil. So I'm asking you by your might and by your power that you would allow me to be able to convey tonight the seriousness, the seriousness of this world that's against us. And that without you, we would be destroyed. I'm glad everybody did decide to join in, join in with us tonight and we're going to Psalm 124. And this is another one of those songs of degrees or a song of accent. In this psalm tonight, we're going to talk about how bad life really is. I say how bad life really is for one that will follow Yahweh. And how much we need his help. How much we need his help. And in this passage, David is going to talk about how it is whenever you're walking with Yahweh and all of the things that come against us because he's going to use his life as an illustration. And he's going to show that with the Most High Son, we can make it, irrespective of what happens. One of the things that I like to do is I like to teach the Bible in such a way that we see that there's a relevance, that it means something to our life, that it will comport with what the scriptures say. And not only that, it has meaningful dialogue that we can look to see what he wants us to know. Now, one of the apostles of the Most High Son, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah, he says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, he walks around like a roaring lion. This being is walking around or walking about seeking whom he may devour. When you read the book, book of Job, you get to see it in action. When you see the book of Job and it says there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, the same was perfect and upright one that feared God and eschewed the eyes, stayed away from evil, and the sons of God, the ben the, the real, the, the, the first sons of God, not the human sons, the sons of God came to present themselves before God, which on the feast days, the earthly sons of God would replicate coming to present themselves before the Most High God. And he says to the accuser, to the Satan, he says, the deceit to the deceiver, um, where you been? I've been walking up and down the earth, to and fro in it. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, there's none like him in the earth. None. Oh, with the God that he could say that about one of us and we were being righteous. But the point being made as we, when we go through the book of Job, you'll get a chance to see that the whole thing behind what he wanted to do was cause Job to blaspheme against God and be destroyed. Why do you bring that up, Tim? Many people, they wipe away the warnings. They wipe away the real danger of this life for a child of God. And they make it as if all that you have to er ever worry about is losing some rewards. This is not what we see in the life of David. This is not what we see in the life of the apostles. Some I mean, you, can you imagine getting your head cut off or being crucified upside down or being flayed and torn apart in Madras, India, like they say Thomas was? Well, let's go into our passage and see where our hope is. Because truly, the world hates us. And if it were not for the Lord, we'd have no hope. If it was not for Yahweh, we would have no hope. It says, if it had not been, if it had not been for the Lord Yahweh who was on our side, if it had not been for the Lord 
Yahweh who was on our side. Now may Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord Yahweh who was on our side when men rose up against us, they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us and the stream had gone over our souls. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord Yahweh, who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. Our help, our help, one more time, our help is in the name of Yahweh, the Lord who made heaven, and earth. Any of you all remember this? I remember growing up, not really knowing this passage, and we just saying, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I be? He said, he kept my enemies away. I don't remember all the words today. <laughs> anyway, the point being made, I know he wrapped you in the cradle of his love, but I, I'm teaching now. I just wanted to give you an illustration. That song said a lot. As I grew up, I began to realize that the Lord is not on my side. I'm on his side. Now, the real question is, were my thoughts correct or is the Bible correct? Obviously, the Bible is correct, and there's a certain amount of reverence that I give to say that I'm on his side. As I heard Dr. Moorcraft talk about, the Anglican preacher said, oh, then these are just songs. This is just poetry. God is never on our side. First of all, let me make sure you understand something. You may not be on the side of your company or the company that's there before you get to work on there. But when you get to work at that company, you're going to be on that side and they're going to be on yours. Let me give you a better illustration. Um, I heard on the radio today the Atlanta Braves, it's a baseball team in Atlanta. I live close to Atlanta. They've gotten two people from two other teams that would have been definitely trying to get what they call the World Series for their teams. Now they have been placed on the Braves team, and guess what? The whole team that would have been against them and whatever team they're coming against, now they're on those pitchers' side. Why? Because it becomes a symbiotic thing. When we are walking in the light of the Most High's Word, when we are following Him, we are on His side, and because He comes in us and because his word comes in us and because he gives us of his spirit he is on the side of his spirit he is on the side of his word he is on the side of his will and if we're intertwined with that he's on our side just like we're on his side the only thing that's guaranteed is this as long as we walk in the light as he is in the light then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Do you like the word of God? I love it. As a matter of fact, when we're in the army, the drill sergeant used to make us say we like it, we love it, and we want more of it, and we didn't want to do any more push-ups. Point being, the writer here, David, who had gone down and was selected by Samuel when everybody else was selected before him. And one of them, God just said, I flat out reject him. What? 16th chapter, 1 Samuel. I reject him. I've already looked at him. He's tall. He's good looking. But Samuel, I have rejected him. I don't see like you see. You look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. So now that we've gotten that clear, that it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, 
and we know to be consistent. Had it not been for us being on his side, he wouldn't have been on our side because we're on his side. Now Israel, who is a prince with El, or uh, that's what Israel means, may Israel, the nation, say who's supposed to be with him, say, if it had not been. What is the focus, Andrina? I can talk to you when I preach. If it had not been, well, the Lord on our side, no matter what we're going to talk about that happened, we would have been destroyed. We would have been overwhelmed. We would have been broken. We'd have been destroyed. I would submit to you, I'm trying to keep the context so that I can come back with the application all at once. I'm going to try to be strong. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Next verse says, Then they had swallowed us up quick. Now I know that Ann has an illustration to put up for those that are watching on the Facebook, but for, for those that don't have it, I'm going to tell you in the 16th chapter of the book of Numbers, three men made an insurrection against God. Moses was on the Lord's side. Moses was walking with God. Moses was not like regular people. No, he was not. The Bible said when I talk to other people, other prophets or whatever, I talk to them in dark sayings. I give them a vision. I give them a dream. Not so with Moses. I talk to him face to face. As a matter of fact, in the 15th chapter, oh, let me finish the point. They tried him, and God opened up the earth and swallowed them. And the Bible said quickly. If you look in the 15th chapter in the Song of Moses in Exodus, he said he swallowed up the Egyptians. And the Bible says they rose up against him. And so here it says they had swallowed us up quick. Andrina has a picture for those that can't see it. I, sh I took a picture of Actually, I took an image from the web where a man had gotten swallowed up in the earth in Florida. I don't know how many years ago. It might have been six or seven. It just swallowed him up quickly in the earth, and the brother couldn't find him. There's a picture that you'll see where the house is right there by the sinkhole. What's the point? You don't have that picture. It should be on the last ones I sent you. If you didn't go back and look, it's in there. That's okay, but there, there are some that I have where there's a man, he's swallowed in a sinkhole. And the point that I want you to understand is this. It's real. Our adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion. He is walking about seeking whom he may devour. This is not play. Saints, this is real. That was real for that man that was swallowed up in the earth. That was real for the family members that won't ever get to see that person again. It was real for the people that followed, followed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. It was real that they were swallowed up in the earth, that their families suffered, and then the ground covered up as if nothing happened. In other words, you're not a necessary being. I am the necessary being. And I'm on Moses' side. Why? Because Moses trusted me. He says, look at it, verse 3. He's talking about the enemies of Yah. They're going to present themselves like they did David. Most scholars, Andrina, and commentaries, different ones, they take this from being around the second Samuel, the fifth chapter where Saul had gone in and Saul had eventually got killed. David come, the Philistines came in and killed Saul. Remember, he went to the witch of Endor and he wanted to get some help from Samuel. Samuel wouldn't help him. So this witch in Endor goes and calls Samuel back from the dead. And Samuel said, why do you disquiet me? Don't you see that God has rejected you? And Saul is, I'm not trying to you. I'm trying to do him. I'm trying to talk to God. He won't talk to me. And Samuel says, today you're going to be where I am. And some people take that to mean that Saul's going to be in heaven. No, no, no. You're going to be in the abode of the residence of the disembodied being. The disembodied beings are called Elohim. So when you read that in 1 Samuel 28, 
you'll find out that she said she saw gods or Elohim coming out of the earth and one of them was Samuel. And so what we what we don't understand is Elohim is a residency place and the residency place of other disembodied beings or beings that don't have flesh and bone and blood like we do. Point being made, Saul died. Now the Philistines were the cause of him dying and now they think they're gonna take over Jerusalem. They think they're gonna take over everything. And David is now put on the throne and God gives David an overwhelming victory over those Philistines people and God gives him the reign over Hebron to his people Judah and all of the men of Israel come. There's a lot of intrigue in there. Gary has taught that when some men went killed Ishbosheth, one of Saul's son, and think he's gonna be David gonna be happy. Go in and cut my man's neck off. You know how bloody that is. I think they say there are five quarts of blood inside of a human. Do you imagine you go and decapitate a man, all that blood, and then they get out there and get to David. Look, look, we got Ishbosheth's head. And David said, what's this? It was another fool like you all one day. And he came and told me that he had killed Saul, and he thought I was going to give him a reward. And you wicked men that went into a man's house and killed a righteous man? And so what we see is David had the victory. David maintained righteousness. He stayed on the Lord's side. And yet all of that victory, he wanted the people to know it wasn't me. It wasn't you. It wasn't Joab, Abishai. It wasn't my mighty men of valor. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, if it hadn't been for the Lord on our side, Israel, say it. Say it, because you all have an attitude that you'll think is your power to give you wealth. You'll think that it's you that's chasing a hundred. You'll think it's you that's chasing a thousand. You'll think it's you that's chasing ten thousand, and you will get fat, and you will kick against God. Let Israel say, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, he said they would have swallowed us up quick. We didn't have the strength. That's the point that David's making. What the point? What's the point? It wasn't us. He says, when their wrath was kindled, when they were hot, they would have shown us no mercy. Verse number four says, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. The stream or like a river. Did you, did you get that? Uh, I sent you one on that one too, showing you a flood where cars were being covered and if the people hadn't come to rescue them, the people had no power because if you get out, of well, first of all, the, if the window is like here, you know where your head is. Mm -hmm. If you open the door, the rest of the water run in. Mm -hmm. If you stay in, you sink. If you get out and you go, the water is moving. And so what he is, David is saying, this is like a flood. Mm -hmm. You have no help. Don't go thinking that I just got out of the car and I walked on the water. No, you didn't. This is how bad it is in the world. This is how bad it was for us. And that's why David starts out to say, if it were not for the Lord on our side, there is no reason for us to ever turn against him. If it were not for the Lord, we'd have been destroyed when the men came up against us and they were hot and their nose flared. That's what Kimball mean, the flaring of the nose. Then he uses a picture of a flood. So you got a picture of men, all of, these, all of this imagery. It's still men, but we know behind it is Satan because Satan does not want the Christ to come in on the scene. So first, we got men upset against us. They rose up against us. Now they are just like, pitch it like a flood coming in quick. Then it says the waters overwhelmed us. Then he said the proud one had gone over our soul. The word soul is an effish. I like the way the word biblical commentary translate that actually they do more than translate they use give what they believe the meaning to be and i couldn't understand when it talks about going over our necks and i was like there's no hebrew word for that but when the guy was going through or the female to explain what they meant is the nefesh is our living part of our fleshly being where do you, where does our nefesh come from 
nostrils and mouth when we breathe. And so in order for it to make your nephesh go away, in order for it to take your life-giving substance, your earthly life, it has to go over your neck. So the picture he is saying, and I like the way that God explained it, the waters had overwhelmed us. It was up to here. The stream had gone over our soul. Now, whether you like the illustration I gave or not, when the water goes over your soul, it is not made for our human bodies to live underwater. But Tim, what about a submarine? You can be foolish if you want to. It says the stream had gone over our soul. The proud waters had gone over our soul. That's twice. Then he says, Baruch Yahweh, blessed Yahweh, and we have it, blessed be the Lord, which means bless the Lord. When you're in that bad shape and he brought you through, don't be like the rappers. Don't be like the temptation. I can turn the gray sky blue. I can make it rain whenever I want it to. Don't be like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. Don't be like the rappers. I got my money. I got my power. No, don't bless yourself in a situation like that when you come out. Bless Yahweh. Bless the Lord. Then he says, who have not given us as a prey to their teeth. Do you understand how do you understand how devastatingly that devastatingly important that is? Now I don't know if her picture shows up, but I gave her a picture of a lion. That had a, a calf. It was a calf or a ram in his teeth. In other words, all he had to do was continually crush. Or I read that a lion sometimes won't key with his teeth. He'll just put his head over your mouth, over because his mouth opens so wide and suffocate you. Oh. You as good as dead. He says, Look, blessed be Yahweh who has not given us. Look as a prey to their teeth. We were there. We were there. Just like David said, a lion had grabbed one of my sheep. That's what he told us all. I took him by the beard and I cacao. I smote him. And then when we hear David talk about that, we begin to understand how powerful that God had worked in the life of David. Then he says something else. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. I have some pictures and for those that don't see it. If you ever watch cartoons, you ever or cartoons or something like Gilligan or one of these old pictures, you'll see a tree bent over and you'll see a rope on the ground they'll cover it with leaves. And when you step in that hole you trigger something that snatches you up in the air. That's a form of a snare. Another form of a snare is something that can catch you like that is called a snare. This it's called a T-Rex. This is a rat trap. Now, when I set this thing, see those teeth? It's supposed to be reminiscent of what they call the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I don't like when I drop my card on the ground. Um, give me that little card right there because I don't want somebody. Uh, he just keep bending over and doing stuff. Thank you, precious love. This T-Rex when a rat comes in and wants to get some food in this little hole, it just, oh my God, did you see, did you see that? Look at the card. I'm saying that what David is saying here, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. Now, when the snare of the fowler, some of them will kill quickly and some of them just strangle them to death. I can take this and put it right here and make it set even lightly. I'm not going to go through because it takes too long. But it says the snare is broken. I have set some of these before, Andrina, and it must have hit so hard that it breaks the back and the animal may get away. It's rare. The picture being made here is our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare. And he says, he says, our help 
is in the name of the Lord. Sometimes people want to, why you say Yahweh? Why you say Yah? Why you say El Elyon? Because there is power in the name of the Lord. We ought to be able in 2019 to know his name is not God. He is God. He is to us the only God, but he does have a name. And we ought to be able to draw strength from that name. Sometimes I enjoy just saying my wife's name, Andrina. I don't want to just say honey or precious love. Sometimes I just like to say Andrina. And if her name was super califragilistic, extraordinary, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to go there. That's just a whole lot to say. I might just call it super. But <laughs> the point being made is the name of the Lord is the Lord. The name of the Lord is the authority of the Lord. The name of the Lord is also throughout this test or the psalm when he gives the test throughout the life of David and those that write. He said the, Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. They run into it in a safe. He says, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Yahweh made heaven and earth. So he taught the people, don't glorify yourself. Don't glorify in our prowess. Glorify in him. And that's where the victory was. That's how you teach your people how to grow. But what good is it for us to read this and not know, be able to look at our own lives? Let's Let's look at our own lives. Let's look at our lives and let's look at what this passage at minimum should be able to say to us. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, and sometimes uh, as an exception, it's not will all, it will not always be the rule because we understand that Christ died for the ungodly. We realize that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, say like when you were on drugs, when you were on crack, when you were on any other kind of drug that it was that had you taken away, maybe opioids, maybe you were even on cocaine or heroin, and somewhere you got off. Maybe it made you sick. Maybe you were in a relationship with somebody you know that you shouldn't have been in. They were beating you just like the woman that got killed today. And they are looking for the man that killed her, and she couldn't get out of that relationship. Had it been sometimes you might have been locked up. Yes, I know what it's like to be locked up for something you didn't do. I said, I know that. Why do you think sometimes I try to tell people, you all listen to everything the news say about Donald Trump, and you believe it. I'm telling you now, I have seen people that have been lied on, and it's been repeated by the media. I'm going to not only tell you that, I'm going to tell you now, we're not supposed to slander but it doesn't matter if everybody believed that you did something that you didn't do. You can still be locked up. You can still pay the penalty. You can still lose your home. But your hope, if you've ever been in that situation, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, what would you do? You didn't just free yourself. Have you ever been in a car wreck and you know you should have been dead? The car was mangled so badly that the police and the emergency people said, I don't know how you got out alive. You had a cancer that have taken so many away. And you want to say, well, you know, I used to take vitamins and Right here, say if it hadn't been for, for the Lord on our side. Have you ever been molested? Have you ever been raped? And the spirit of that individual that raped you or molested you or fondled you and that thing got into you and you learned to like it and you learned to love it and you wanted more of it and they, now you begin to think that this is the way I was born or this is the way I'm supposed to be and now you've given yourself over the sensuality and the lust of the flesh and there are all kinds of diseases, especially in the Atlanta area. And you want to know, how did I come out? I was enjoying myself in that. Have you ever liked to just fight? I, I didn't know people like to fight like that. You can watch YouTube and, and you can see people like the street fight and they get paid for it. But you say, how did I come out when other people have died? David is saying, if it hadn't been for the Lord. Now say it. If it hadn't been for the Lord, Tim Merritt would have been destroyed by now or would have destroyed somebody else and still be waiting to be destroyed. 
Don't take God's credit because it's the most high God who has given you the ability to get out of a situation that you have no power to get out of. That's what this thing is showing. We should have been losing. We should have been gone. Then he says, when men rose up against us and they would have swallowed us up quick, as the black people in America, how dare we think that it was an emancipation proclamation of Dr. Martin Luther King that freed us? How dare you think that whenever they took us under what you call the doctrine of discovery, after Columbus came over here to America, and then he came over here, and there were already black people here, the Folsom people, the same kind of people that you see on the images in North and South, I mean, in South America, and they're going to tell you that you weren't here, and you're going to believe the history that they write, and you're not going to take the history of other people because they're not on the mainstream, and the people that are the mainstream are telling you, and you had a politician say, last night in America, 10 years and the world going to be destroyed because of climate change. 12 years and the world going to be destroyed because of climate change. They were saying that when I was going to East Hall High School in the seventh grade. And so, but you don't believe that they are religious, but they are giving you an apocalypse. They are giving you an end of the world. They are giving you a plan of salvation. Stop using your deodorant. Stop using this, that, and other. Stop using your car. I submit to you that what the Bible is showing is that any individual that has a different agenda, any individual that does not like the most high you are their enemy, they will come against you, they'll try to destroy you, and if it were not for the Lord on your side. Tim, how do you mean somebody come against you? Do you think that crack came into the black neighborhood by uh, accident? When they had the Nicaragua, it was a, a, a contrast, in Nicaragua, and Reagan was president, and they were funding the freedom fighters. That's when that cocaine, they start bringing that cocaine in and giving it to this guy. He was working with them, and Rick Ross, not the fat one, not the one that had the surgery, that lived in the old Evander Holyfield house. I'm talking about the real one. I'm talking about the real Rick Ross. Go look it up. They call him Freeway from the freeway, Rick Ross, and let him tell you how they did it. And the same thing when they sent the opioids and did it in China. I'm going to tell you that every person that has gotten off a of crack when so many died. So many died. So many were in videos doing things that ought not to be done. So many experiments have been done on black people. And you think that we overcame on our own? If it had not been for the Lord on our side. Well, black people, you should say. If you call yourself any other nationality that have been oppressed like the Ukrainians, what you should say. If you're any other person that have been down and you were labeled as if you were crazy and you weren't and they were giving you drugs and you got off some kind of way, you need to say, let God be magnified and blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, when men rose up, they would have swallowed us up quick. How many times did they want to send every black person back to Africa? How many times they want to erase us with other people? And even now, at the border, we want to erase you. We want to dilute you so much that you have no more power. But I will submit to you right now as an individual, when you look in your life and you see where it says, you know what? They would have swallowed us up quickly. You ever had a gun pull out on you? I have. You ever had guns pull out on you more than once? I have. How did I get away? The gun was pulled. I remember one time a guy pulled a gun out on me, and I was fit. And it's like, if I can just, if I can just get close, I'm going to take this gun. I said, I might get shot. I'm going to take this gun. And he, he just knew what he was doing. Later on, Andrina, about four or five days later, I saw a guy was walking down the street in Atlanta. He said, man, I don't know how you got away from that. He, I said, what you mean? When that guy had that gun on you. That was on what is called Northside Drive at this time. And now I'm down here what they call Simpson Road. So in, in other words, it's like downtown Atlanta where the Mercedes Benz theater. I mean, I call it the theater. The Mercedes Benz thing is. And it's about two miles down. Right. And I said, you saw that? He said, yeah. I said, I didn't do anything. I said, 
Actually, the way he stood back like that with the pistol, I couldn't get to him. And he had an ability to duck down and reach in my pocket, took my money, and said, you ain't got no, and he didn't say darn money, stuck my money back in my pocket, okay? And then reached in my, got in my car, did like this, had the pistol on me, reaching in my car, checking my dash and under my seat while a gun was pointed at my chest, and then he said, get out of here. So I drive off from there, and I'm mad. I'm thinking militar militarily, and then I'm thinking, you had no business being here. I won't tell him myself. So anyway, the guy told me, he said, you look like a bounty hunter. Like I said, I was fit then, in a small ways and all. He said, you look like a bounty hunter, and he, I think he's wanted. So, that's why he was checking for the gun. Now, how can I say, you know, I intimidated him. The gun was on me. <laughs> the gun was on me. Listen to me. I know I was living an ungodly life then. I know I was. Can Tim say, blessed be God? And it's not the stuff that's happened like that. And I'm saying, when I read this passage, I would have been overwhelmed. I had no way to get out. And then I asked the guy, I said, what kind of gun was it he had? At that time, I didn't know much about pistols because I dealt with other kind in the military. He said it was a nine. I said, so what's a nine? I mean, how does a nine work? If he shoot, he got the key. He said, oh, no. He said he mashed it one time. It would have emptied in you. And see, I'm thinking... Like when they roll, <laughs> I'm thinking he's going to get one shot off and I'm going to be able to take it. I'd have been dead. I'd have been dead. So it says, when their wrath was against us, the stream had gone over our soul. He would have swallowed me up quick. The stream would have gone over our soul. I know that sometime in church life, in church life, think about the young boys out there at the church. And now, you know, I don't mind saying it, but I'm just not going to say it tonight. Okay. The five young boys are young men, and everybody in the world know that their pastor was doing something to them that shouldn't have been done. And the church did not stand with them. Do you not think that's overwhelming? Do you think that doesn't hurt? Do you think that somewhere in your soul, everybody looked up to the pastor being the great one, like the great man of God. They wrapped the pastor up in a Torah. They raised the pastor up like he was a king and marched around. How can I say anything against this pastor? Everything he said must be right there. Even the sheriff of the Cab County go to this church. Council members go to that. All kind of people that's big and have notoriety. And we're somebody because we're with him. And whatever that little thing on the inside say, this ain't right. They could say, had it not been for the Lord, it never would have got out. We could have said things to this day and nobody would have ever believed us. It says the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. How many of us know for a fact we've been in situations where we should have or could have been locked up because we were with the wrong person? And we just, I've heard people say, actually, I got a niece. I, since I have more than one, I can say it. I was, going some, I was going somewhere with somebody. And I just decided not to go. And she said, they went and robbed the place. Remember that? Mm -hmm. They went and robbed the place. And said, I would have been with them. And, and that woman probably still, my niece worked. She don't need your money. They're like, I got stacks on deck. I don't know if she still say that anymore. But she works. Had it not been for the Lord that was on our side, had it not been the Lord on our side when they were raping our men, breaking the buck, as they call it, when they were taking our children, and you could have rose up the fight, they could have mowed you down some kind of way you were able to endure. Had it not been for the Lord on our side, we would not exist as a people anymore. Don't you think if it were not for the Lord, the aborigines people would be gone? Do you not know that right now in South Africa, had it not been for the Lord, all of those that land would have been gone. It would have been gone because people decide we're going to do globalism or colonialization or colonizing and we're going to take it. And here Satan is. You want to enslave us.
this trap? Let me tell you what you do. If you can't catch a rat on this kind of trap, and let the rat get used to going in and out. These eight and eleven because in the guilt, God. Say it loud. They hurt. A lot of it. They would take. That are doing the things of Satan. Satan wants to take all of. He is the one that Peter says your adversary. And if you've ever been able to overcome anything, it's because of the Lord. Can they hear me now? Yes, I think they So I'm about to, to stay calm. That's going to be hard, but I can do it. So he says, the stream had overflowed our soul, gone over our soul. The proud waters had gone over our soul. Our whole society puts us in the water when we start going to school. They teach us to dishonor the Most High. They teach us to love yourself, whereas loving yourself puts an individual in the place where they're not lovers of God. They give us a great idea of who we are. They tell us that there is no truth, and that is the truth. And so what happens is when you use Jacques Derrida's methodology of saying there ain't no truth, you don't understand writing, that was to wipe away the distinctiveness of the gospel message. Well, get out, you know it's him. It wasn't good luck. If you've been able to because your preachers have Rewards. You better. Day of wrath. You are. A we are just like in the teeth of an animal. This is how bad it is. And if you get away when you know so many people did. Let God get the glory. If it hadn't been for the Lord, David said, Saul had chased him like a dog. The whole nation knew it. How do you think we even got to the place right now that we have a modicum of freedom in America? It's the Lord. Everything was against us. That's why we, as a collective group, on one half of a percent, of the wealth of the United States because we were brought here to be a slave class. We were brought here under the doctrine of discovery after Columbus came over here and when he went back in 1493, the Catholic Church wrote the doctrine of discovery. Don't, don't let these words slip you. That is, that's a legal term, the doctrine of discovery. Go and Christianize or Catholicize the world. You, Spain, you, Portugal, do that. And you took these black Hebrew people and you baptized them and gave them Catholic Christian names, separated them from their family. Yes, separated them from their families. 
and sent them over here and made slaves out of the pro with the Protestant Christian people and the people that you get a chance to see that own the ships that now we say they're Jewish. But if you go and look and read their own writings, they'll let you know that we we got Russian background, we have Polish background, we 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 are not exactly who we say that we are. But when we had a choice either to follow Islam, we knew if we weren't going to go under Islam, we would be under Islamic rule. So in the Caucasus Mountain, I'm not going to go that deep into it. If you want to read it, you read about it in the 13th tribe. Uh, it is written by a Jewish guy. And then if they went under the Catholic Church, they would be under the emperor. So what they did was they talked and they found out that there's another branch that both of you all agree to is Judaism. And so he chose Judaism. So that's why you get your Kassars and you begin to understand that there's more to it than what you say, but we're going to teach you what we want to teach. And we'd be swallowed up, Andrina. As a boy, I grew up a Negro. Then I became colored. Then I became black. Now they want to say, if it were not for the Lord, we'd be erased. We'd be wiped away. And so when you look at these scriptures and you see every situation of man will sometimes like in the teeth of animals, how do we get away? How do we get free? How do we get free from drugs? How do we get free from our habits that we cause? They tell you that you've got these addictions and things the Bible calls it sin. You didn't have to take your first drink if you couldn't handle it. You didn't have to do that first drug. Now you're caught. Then he says, our soul is escaped like a bird out of the snare of the fowler, just like it broke. The trap broke. It's broken and we are escaped. Every one of these situations is resolved in the person. It's resolved in the person that God sent his son, Yeshua Jesus, to break the snare, to tear the net up that catches the bird, when you're flooded to come in and pull us out, when we're overwhelmed that he can bring us to the place that we can be situated in a place where they can't get us, when they rise up against us to beat us down and they want to destroy us and their nose is hot, they're flared, he comes in as a savior. And I would submit to you that until we begin to recognize and trust God as he is, to be our savior, we're going to think we get ourselves out of all situations. And often we're still in the same position that we're in because our biggest enemy is not the people that's against us. It wasn't slavery. It wasn't colonization. It's not your drugs. It's not somebody pulling a gun on you. Your biggest problem is your adversary, the devil. That's a roaring lion. Walking about, seeking, whom he may devour. Can you give him the credit? If you don't give him the credit, rest fully assured, assured that you're in one of these situations. You're in somebody's teeth. You're in his teeth. You're either being flooded by him. Some kind of way he's got something going on and you're in a snare. You're tied up in something you can't get out of. You have one of those one of those relationships you shouldn't been in and you can't get out of it every day getting worse and your bills going and everything. We need a savior. We don't need Superman. Superman is supposed to be like a savior. Nietzsche talked about the Superman. We don't need a Superman. We don't need a Batman. We don't need a Hulk. We don't need Laura Craft. I mean the word of God in doing can be like Israel and say, look, blessed be God. Yeah, I was short tonight on purpose. I made my point. But we're going to dig in again, if the Lord will, on Sabbath, Saturday. But right now, if it's not for the Lord, if it's not for Yahweh, you'll be destroyed. Anything that you've overcome is Him. It's Him. Father, thank you for your blessed word, your truth and your majesty and power. I ask you by your might, take us out of the flood. Take us from the teeth of the animals. 
Take us from the snares of the foul or the trap. Let us not become so arrogant that we think that we can just dance around the trap and we're not getting caught, but that we realize that it's you and that we can be like David no matter how many times we overcome, that we realize, let our mouth say, blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I open our class for discussion. If there's going to be any discussion tonight, if there's going to be any discussion or if someone is even on the Facebook, if they want to join into the verbal discussion, all they have to do is dial 404-406-9585. Now I'm opening back up the conference line. Anyone on the conference line have any comments? tonight. I heard a noise, but I know not what that means. Andrea, did you have anything precious? I don't know if that was Gary or someone else. No, it wasn't. Anything or nothing? I saw. I saw that the uh, the camera was acting up. And the thing is, is that if we had paid little, you know, little money, we would think like, okay. But that happens with everything where we live. All si all signals are bad. If it has nothing to do with God, if I just want to call you and say I love you, like what? What you say? I can't hear you. Now I like, forget it. <laughs> because it gets it gets to be something else after hundred. That's okay. That's okay. I know. And then sometimes I call you and you say the call didn't go through. True. And it won't even show up on my phone that you even called. Should we say that's the, the, the roaring lion? Of the devil Amen. trying to try to keep us from no. bringing out the glory of God in our lives. I might have just been boring tonight. I mean, I I could have took longer. No, um, you you were not boring. Okay. Well, at least I heard your I, voice. And listening to it, you know, it still made me think of um. We still have to be faithful, and you know, there are many who talk about just believing, and it's only a mental thing. It, it really, it goes way beyond that. And if, if we understand that, when you know, we talk about David, and, and I think you did mention him grabbing the beard of a lion and, and so forth. He had he had some training for that. He had patience, and he and if we know that he. He had faith in the Lord and was living, you know, in his earlier, in his earlier life by by praying to, to God and wanting to, you know, please God and you know, exercising not just thinking, exercising that that faith into how he lived, and that's 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 essential because um, I think I don't remember which verse it is, but it says, "If I faint in a day of adversity, thy strength is small," and it is it's true. You know, so in looking up, I think the prior um, division, 123, was uh, looking up to the hills. You know, if it had not been for the Lord, you know, and it really looks like when you look at a lot of the uh, passage in the scripture, he does he does need us to be emptied out of self and understand that it is, it is him. Um, I thought it was a very encouraging message, and I, I think it it's, it's good to be reminded. You know, so when we say we're, we do patient and comfort other strips, strips of the scriptures might have hope. Definitely, definitely there tonight. And it is very miraculous, you know, uh, in this country that we we still can um, look at the the word of God or to see that, you know, um, as, a, as a black race, that there are still some of us here. You know, That's true. This, this population, 
what they call population control and wanting to, you know, um, go to other countries and stuff and, and determine how many babies should be born or who shouldn't be born. It's, it's, it's very serious. It's amazing how people want to talk about freedom of expression, but they, they, they don't realize they're jumping on the same bag, bandwagon and saying what, what the media is telling them to say. Amen. It, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, but with the scriptures, it teaches us how to think. Mm. It how to think um, rightly. And so one of, if, if we just take um, an example, the tattoo is supposed to talk so much independence. You can get the, the image you want on it, you can get the color, and, you know, they can be hidden, but most people show them, and it's supposed to really show independence freedom and, 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 and just individualism and it's like every you can't hardly go outside the door without seeing it. And I'm just like, wow, do people really know how to think? I don't I don't think so. We think what we're told and if we anybody's gonna tell us we need to be listening to the one who may have it in her. So I, it was encouraging, it was good for me. I don't always have a lot maybe to say, but um I'm enjoying the messages, and they, they are encouraging to me, and uh, I do hear them, and sometimes I hear them without going back and actually listening to them, if it's a, a, a main uh, thing or a section, but I do go back and listen to different ones from time to time, so I, I enjoyed it. Well, thank you, and yeah, I have plenty of scriptures to talk, to talk about tonight, and I, you know, what were they? <laughs> See what kind of wife I had, Gary. I when I was yeah. when I was thinking about a lot of the scriptures, one of the ones that came to my mind. I've already told you, be sober, be vigilant. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about Proverbs twenty-eight and fifteen, mm -hmm. where it says, "As a roaring lion, and a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people." Mm. So if you have a wicked ruler over you, and you're talking about my adversary. I don't have an adversary like a roaring lion. If you can't see Satan, if you can't see that situations are such that you need the Lord, then you don't understand a wicked, a wicked ruler can do things to you, even if he's saying and doing policies you like. Mm -hmm. You see, because when we talk about, when Gary was saying a little while ago, it's amazing that we're here. Now, there's a woman that uh, she made a post on my face on, on Facebook and I shared it mm -hmm. and she's white mm -hmm. and I don't have no problem with her being white she didn't make the laws mm -hmm. that I hate mm -hmm. but she showed where they say six million Jews were killed by Hitler then beside that she shows nine, uh, 18 million so many so many almost 20 million black babies or have been killed in America by genocide, by people that have voted a Supreme Court, and people that will say me too, and they want to let the babies be dead, and she's just showing the comparison, which is worse. Mm. And then she showed, I think, 60 million in all have been killed in America. 60 million babies. And they sell our black baby parts to different people, and the mother that have paid you to kill the baby or been told that you that it wasn't a baby. They used to say it wasn't a child. I remember that. They call it a fetus. They went Latin on yeah, you. Yeah. They know you don't know Latin. And then now they say different things. But the point being made is, is that when you can kill 19 million black babies, they let you know we don't want you here. We don't want anybody on the ne'er-do-well class. And when he was talking about doing population control, that was dealing with us mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah. And the, and the methodology that was used in a different place is they're savages. That was it. They're savages. We need to give them Christianity and give them civilization. When Christianity is not biblical, when Christianity does not follow the teaching of the Most High, when Christianity does not love its neighbor as itself, does not love God first, and that means loving his word, when it does not tell the truth, when it does not build up somebody instead of take pillage rape, then I don't want it. If that's what your Christianity is, I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't even want to look at it. It's an abomination. Go precious. I was going to say, and to add on to 
on to that, how many died in the slave trade, how many were killed and murdered because they actually were murdered. There were no accidental deaths in the slave trade. If you tack on that amount and you realize that it's like there's something sinister going on. Yes. And so this made me think of Psalm 83. Okay. And the way that it reads, it it lets you know what happens with the people who love God. But even he just goes even further than that, and he says they're gonna hate you for my name's sake. You know, so um, in Second Psalm eighty three, I th- I already said eighty two and eighty three mixed up or something. Did you? Eighty two is the one that has that has about the most high and in, in the midst. So it says, um, keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Listen to what they did. They have taken crafty counsel against your people. Yes, Lord. In order to affect him. They're angry with him. They're outraged with him. They're his enemies. What did they do? They came against his people. Lord have mercy. Truth, truth, truth. And so you see that that is the thing that he was saying to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, I'm going to make you a defense city. I'm going to make you this wall, a brazen wall. I'm going to put you out there and you're going to be, they're going to fight against you. But you're going to say what I'm telling you to say. They're going to be your enemies because first they hated me first. Mm-hmm. And because we are in league and in line and love him and desire to walk with him and to rule and reign with him, they're our enemy. And because they cannot reach up into the sky mm-hmm. and get him, we can't build a tower to him to get him, but we know his people. How do we know his people? Because they sound like him. They're walking like him. They're, they have the same judgment, the statutes, the ordinances. We know who they are because they sound like him. And that was the very thing that he told Moses with the people. This is your wisdom and your understanding before the nation. When you start looking like him, and speaking like him, and doing like him, they're your enemies, because they're his enemies first. And so it made me think about that, like, that's really the issue, is that, even that book, The Long War Against God. Yes, Henry Morris. And he he shows that how nations have been fighting against God and against his statutes and against his judgment and anybody else who falls in line with those things they're going to fight against you they're going to look and seek to destroy you they're going to take counsel against you to find ways to destroy you because like you said in effigy they are destroying him amen and so that that was my thought that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful thought as a matter of fact, it prompted something in my mind, and I guess I'll turn to it. Can you call it turn if it's on a computer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I want you to look at Colossians chapter 1, and I want you to see why Satan does what he does to us. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and 21, mm-hmm. talking to the people at Colossae, mm-hmm. it says in you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now listen to this closely. If you continue in the faith, not just because you say a sinner's prayer, not just because you went to church, not because you can sway to the music. It says, if you continue in the faith, 
This is, I'll make you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue to faith, grounded and settled, and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have free, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul am a minister. Listen to this. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church where I'm, I have been made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of Christ. He is saying, because I walk with Christ, because I'm a servant of Christ, there is still some more suffering that Satan wants to do to Christ's people. Someone say, Tim, you're wrong. You're just making it up as you go. Then I'll say, first of all, not only are you ignorant and uh, you don't know the scripture, you do error because you don't know the scripture or the power of God, but I'll say you're telling a damnable lie. First of all, according to the Bible, Paul, who is called Saul, he went and made havoc against the called out of the church. And then on his way to go get some, a light shone from heaven, and he was thrown down to the ground, and he began to say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And who is your Lord? Who are you, Lord? I mean, yes, you are who you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He knew experientially in yeah. ways that other people don't that when you represent the most high the way that you should, that when I attack you, I'm trying, I'm attacking him in effigy because we image him. And so now Paul is on the right side now That's and he right. say, I'm suffering for his sake. And I was thinking about Matthew 10 if, if they don't want to, if they don't want Paul's testimony, you can have the Lord's testimony. He says, oh, you shall be brought before governors. Wait a minute, let me go back. Go back and get it all. He said, uh, I, send you, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the council, and they will scourge you in their synagogue. In the church, as we would you, call it. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you will speak, for it will be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. To death. And the father, the child, to death. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put and you shall be hated of all for my name's sake. That in name. You hated for me. But. But. Tell him. He that, that endureth how long? to the end uh -huh. shall be saved. What about, it is say is saved? Shall be saved. Uh -huh. Because it's a process. You initially saved to be saved. In other words, you get a job to do a job. I mean, come on. You get a job to do a job. Well, since you provoke my thoughts, and I did, this just reminds me of the kind of fun we plan on having tomorrow when we just do discussion. The other scripture that I had was 2 Timothy 4 and 17, where the scripture where Paul was talking about stuff he went through. Paul says, notwithstanding, this is when everybody had forsaken him. Mm -hmm. He said, the Lord stood with me mm -hmm. and strengthened me. That by the preaching, he said, that my preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Paul had been locked up in high places. He had been before Festus. He had been before Felix. He wanted to go see Caesar. He understood that the human things that he was going through, there's a lion behind it. And his people began to act like brute beasts, and they are lions. David talked about, and I mentioned it, I just didn't read it, in 1 Samuel 17. Did you have anything to say about Paul or delivering out of the mouth of the lion? In 1 Samuel 
1737 when David was talking and uh, Saul was still king at this time. And he wanted David, won't you do things the way I do it? This is the way I do it is what I wear when I go out and, you know, I don't care. You really look ridiculous and it's too big for you, but at least you put on that. We'll, we'll, what they call it, a sacrifice? We'll let you be sacrificed. And David wouldn't do it. And like, boy, you just a boy. you just a boy. And David was telling what had happened and about the lion, and he told what had happened with the bear. And David said, moreover, Yahweh that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine or Philistine. And Saul said, David, go, and Yahweh be with you. See, this is the kind of testimony David had before he was king. And he had already, he had fought with a real bear and a real lion. And now that he has been made king and now he's had victory, God has given him freedom from Saul, freedom from everybody thinking he's a fugitive. And instead of being a fugitive, now you're the king. Instead of being the one that's hunted, now people want your blessing. He is still saying, look, the same God that I talked about then that delivered me is the same one that delivered me from that lion Saul. And from that bear, those people that were with him that wanted to get up and kill 85 of the priests of the Lord, he is the same one that delivered me from the Philistines. He is the same one that delivered me out of all of those things. He is consistent. I give God the credit. Even He could have said, let me tell you something, dude. I mean, uh, King, Mr. King. I fought a lion. I ain't scared of him. I fought a bear. A bear that can swipe and cut you to the ball. I can fight. I'm fast. But he credited it to the Lord. And even when he went to Goliath, you come out after me with sword and spear. You ain't got enough. <laughs> Your lips still uncircumcised. I come to you in the name of the living God whom you have defied. Would the God we talk to ourselves like that whenever we want to sin, when we want to stay with the, what they call an addiction or, or, or some kind of trouble or something that we bound under, would the God we would talk like that when people are going to threaten us and take our lives or take our jobs? And I, I come in the name of the Lord. Yeah. I trust him. Take my life. Go back to Matthew 10, 28. What does it say? Do you remember my heart? Mm -hmm. starts out, fear not man. Okay. That can kill the body. And that's all he can do. But rather fear him that after he's killed, body can put body and soul in hell. In other words, fear me. So you ask me what kind of scriptures did I not read. I had Exodus 15 and 12 when Moses' song said, you stretched out your hand. I can't take credit for Pharaoh. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. He swallowed your slave masters. He swallowed your oppressors. He swallowed those that were doing genocide on your babies. He swallowed those that took your wealth, your resources that you made and made it appropriate for them he took it. He took those that made that actually got you in a culture that would turn you against the Most High. He swallowed them quickly. Mm. Why would we not believe and trust him? So then Paul in the New Testament talks about being swallowed up. Individual that have gone and done wickedly. Individual that has been corrected and that has taken the correction. He tells them in 2 Corinthians 2 and 7. He says, so contrary-wise, or that contrary-wise, you ought to forgive him. Forgive that person. Mm -hmm. And confront him, lest perhaps such a one should be over, I mean, should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. It's not about you going and what to get to the place that you want to kill yourself. Kill yourself spiritually, break up your sin with righteousness. Lose your life for Christ that you can gain and not be overcome. Every time you turn around, I need to repent. I just messed up again. Lay your hand on me and push my hand backwards. And then speak in a tongue because I'm in mess again. And lay your hand on me. Ah, you at the altar. No. Stand strong in the Lord. And David... David mentioned all those things, and you can't ever, you can't get out of the mouth of the lion. 
Why is God different? He talking about getting out of the lion's teeth. You're overwhelmed in a flood. You can't get out the flood. He can't get you out the flood. And he can do it for David. He can't let the thing that's come over your head to destroy and overwhelm your soul. You can't get out of that. You can't get out of the snare. You can't get out of the net. Where is your God? Obviously, your God has got you tied down because the God we have, he's a deliverer. Yeah. That's what you just said reminded me of Psalms 32 and 3. Luke chapter one, and it's some, it's I think it's Zechariah mm -hmm. talking, mm -hmm. but he's talking about that's what the Ground um, the son of David was brought here for to deliver us from our enemies. Yeah, let me read it. It's real pretty. Luke about Luke one seventy four, and it, and you. And he was in the spirit when he did, and they could understand what he said. That he would deliver, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Not fear of him, but fear of our enemies. Right. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. That's deep. I actually, I actually need to go back. So that was the conclusion of the matter. But the beginning of the matter was, blessed be the Lord, bless Yahweh, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and have raised up a horn or a power of salvation for us in the house of his servant, Dawid David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and the hand of all them that hate us mm, to perform yeah. to perform the mercies promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our fathers Abraham that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear yeah. and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life I'm you know to that. yes I'm Lord forward. yes our black enemies, our yeah. white enemies, our Chinese enemies, our wretched enemies, the flesh that the flesh that keep trying to fight against us, deliver us. I mean, the first deliverance was deliverance from our own sins, our own filth, our own weakness, yes, our own unrighteousness, mm -hmm. and that victory alone should be be able to sustain you. It should. Let you let you know that the faithfulness. Of the Lord. It's like, don't you know the Lord? Don't you know your own self? Haven't you changed? Haven't you received the power? Don't you know it? So even if he can do you yes. and change you, you are a witness to the majesty, to the glory, to the victory. Why is it then that every time you come up against something, you cry and you barely ache, you doing what they did in when they came out of Egypt, you do it after all he had shown them. We are hungry. You brought us in here to die. You know, and it's like, how? You've seen all these things. What did? How did? How did you? What did you equate that to in your mind? That now you thought I brought you out here to die. I could have left you in Egypt to die. What are you thinking? What are you thinking about the things that you see? How are you? How is it computing with you that it doesn't equal my faithfulness, and that I'm I am a deliverer? How did, how is it not adding up to that to you? Do you think you did it by your own strength? Do you think Pharaoh was just stupid and clumsy, and he just he just made a great mistake, and you know, karma did something to him, or you know, how, why would how are you calculating this? You've seen these things. How what does it equal that I brought you out here to die? And we get like that when we come up against something. It's like, oh, I'm weak again. How many times you're going to be weak? How many times has he shown you his faithfulness? And you won't trust him now. Trust him. He can get you out of it. We say he's not going to even let a, too much be on you that you can't handle. 
He'll give you a way of escape. He's good. But how is it that you, this is how we forget God. and We don't forget forgetting, but we forget his wonderful work. And we stop adding them up and saying, hey, this equals this because I've seen this. That's what David did. That's exactly what David did. He let me kill a lion and a bear. I've had victory. He's given me victory. Now, I can say it with my own strength, I and could. I just love my sheep that much. <laughs> but I understand who was with me. So as small as I am, this big dude is nothing. Yes, right. He said, because it's the Lord's battle. It is. Anyway, that, that was my thought. I like that, because what ends up happening is we underestimate what the Most High Son is doing. We, we make it as if all it is is about coming to church and reading the Bible verse. It's about impregnating your mind with this word. Yeah. It's about impregnating your mind. It's about being welded to this word. It's about being screwed to this. When you take the screw and they, they got a thing, they call it torque it, okay? When it's when it's got the holes yeah, on like a motor, right. they torque it. So so yeah. it doesn't just vibrate or loose. We, we need to be so infused with his word that when the victory comes, first thing we thank you.